as we sung tonight, it's just you and me here now. It's just you and me. Your presence is all I need, my God. Your voice is all I need. Your approval is the only thing that satisfies me. This beautiful shadow of our present day blessing, this tabernacle, this dwelling place, not this just holy place, that this most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is the glory of God dwelled. And we saw that mercy seat in the midst of the cherubim, the blood of the lamb that was shed where the presence of God, where he said, I'll meet you there. Here he has this beautiful calling of intimacy with him. He says, every day I want you to sacrifice a lamb in the morning and the afternoon. Every single day. Day, I want your eyes and your mind and your hands to be about the blood of the Lamb. Every day of your life. That's why Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Man, here's our Lamb in the morning and the evening. Thank you, Lord, for the blood you shed. It's because of the blood of the Lamb, the sinless Lamb that was shed, that I'm able to hear you speak to me. I'm able to be in your presence and to boldly come into the most holy place of God and find grace and mercy to help me because I'm a wreck. (laughs) And I need you every day, Lord. This incredible picture, this shadow that speaks of our present day activity is beyond rich. It's so pregnant with life and application for the New Testament saint. Words can't express just how rich it is. As we go through the book of 1 Samuel, we're going to see some incredible things about the presence of God and the dwelling place of God. Tonight, we take a look at the life of Eli and his sons, beginning with the life of Samuel to be the last judge in that era before the first king and the age of the kings come about. But as we look at this chapter 2 and we look at There's going to be a real contrast of priests that minister to the Lord in the presence of the Lord between Samuel and the sons of Eli. The presence of the Lord was there whether the sons of Eli were ministering or Samuel was ministering. His presence is here even as we worship and we offer ourselves to him. Some are sensing his presence and are speechless. Others are bored looking at their watch. Why so? Why can someone be in the house of the Lord and one is just overtaken by the dwelling presence of Almighty God who's speaking and another one is just almost in contempt? Why is one priest awestruck and being changed and transformed and drawn into the the wedding chamber of God and the other one is just going, I'm bored? Well, we look at the lives of Samuel, this young type of priest of the Lord, if you would, and these other sons of Eli. We're going to see some things that might shake us up a little bit tonight, but I don't know about you, but I think we need to be shaken up. I think the church of Jesus Christ needs a radical shaking. That's why I'm so grateful the word says that judgment begins with the house of God, not condemnation, but purification. We need to be purified. We need to be called out from our religious activities and find true intimacy with God and away from it's what we do to it's what he did, right? Somebody say amen. Amen. Yeah, don't hold back on the amens tonight. This be an agreement, amen? 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 (laughs) Okay, let's take a look at Samuel chapter 2. Picking up where we left off last week at this incredible song of praise that Hannah sung to the Lord in gratitude for God heard her cry. Maybe you got a cry tonight. I got good news for you. Time will pass and God will hear. He's already hearing it, but a time will come where the old birth, the answer will come. Even as Samuel asked for by God, a Samuel will come your way. And man, Praise will just flow from your mouth. This incredible song of praise. If you weren't here last week, I encourage you just to even study that and parallel that even with Mary's song of praise in Luke chapter 1. I mean, the parallel is crazy cool. But anyway, we're going to pick up where we looked at last week in verse 11 where it says, Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child, Samuel, ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. Now, the sons of Eli were corrupt, or another version says worthless, worthless. 
They did not know the Lord. Stop there. Here, talk about a staunch contrast of light and darkness, of religion and relationship. Man, little Samuel. Understand that Samuel was somewhere between three and five years old when he was weaned. We're not sure exactly how old he is, but he's still a kid for sure. And, and here we see this contrast of a young kid where his parents go back to Ramah, but Samuel says, my life is not about following after my parents. It's about following after the Lord. That's what my very breath and every heartbeat and pulse is all about is to minister or to serve him. Verses the sons of Eli, the high priest at that time, that says they were worthless and they did not know the Lord. Now understand what it says, they didn't know the Lord. It doesn't mean they didn't have a conscious understanding. They had not read the books of Moses. They didn't understand the calling and responsibilities of the Levite. They didn't know the name Jehovah. They knew the Lord. They didn't know the Lord. And there's a lot of priests today, well, they go to school, they get degrees, they get lots of notches on their belt of leading people in a prayer to ask Jesus in their heart, but they don't know the Lord. They haven't experienced him. In other words, his presence is all around, but they don't know the peace and the joy and the love of Almighty God. They just don't know. They haven't experienced, because see, knowing the Lord is a real paradox, because it's like Paul prayed, and we looked at it last week, about that I pray you know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. I'm going to know something that's beyond what my mind can figure out. It's something experiential that is spiritual, it's eternal, and it is incredible. The sons of Eli, what they had is religion. Samuel was having this relationship. But this is what's crazy, is both of them are in the presence of the Lord. The sons of Eli didn't have a passionate relationship with God. They were worthless. We'll find out they're on a holy hit list by God. They're done for. And do you know that sometimes people can be so far gone, there is no hope. The New Testament calls a blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. People can get so far and so desensitized, so slanderous to the presence of God. They've been touched so many times by the Holy Spirit that they can be in his presence and not even be conscious of God in their life. It's, it's a long journey to get there, but it happens. And I tell you, there's no better way for the enemy to do that and bring a person that other than a religious environment. That's why it's so beautiful. The prodigal was given nothing to come to his senses. Well, they didn't have nothing. They had a lot going on for them. And they don't even know what's going on here. Can you imagine the Lord looking at your life and saying, you're worthless? But God loves everybody. Hmm. Does God love everybody? I guess you've got to think about the context of it. He loves everybody in the sense of he died for everybody. God so loved the world. He loves everybody. But can someone reject that love to the point where they're actually hated by God? We'll come back to that. It's important you understand that the contrast inside this scripture here is grieving God's heart. For God to say that they're worthless is extreme. I want to read to you a scripture in Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, before we see hundreds of years of silence before John the Baptist, the prophet, comes on the scene. And nothing new under the sun at this point in history, which is, of course is after this t- Eli's age, It says in Malachi chapter 1, and this is pertaining to the house of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, and offerings that ministers are supposed to offer to God. Malachi chapter 1 verse 6 says, A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts to you priests who despise me. Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? You offered defiled food on my altar. But say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. 
And when you offer blind as a sacrifice, is this not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? But now entreat God's favor or his grace that he may be gracious to you while this is being done by your hands. Will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. Before we look at verse 11, God is saying, I'd rather you just shut the doors to the temple than do what you're doing. I'd rather you not be here at all than engage in this hurtful hypocrisy in my presence. Verse 11, from the rising of the sun, even till it's going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it. And that you say the table of the Lord is defiled in its fruit, its food is contemptible. You also say, oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver who has his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord with what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. I think we heard from the lion. But Dave, is this really applicable to the New Testament because God is love? Let me tell you, there's nothing more that I like to talk about than the love of God. I'm so jazzed about going through the Song of Solomon and seeing the heart, the alluring heart of God from creation, creator to creation. It's incredible. But tonight, understand, we want the whole counsel of God's word in our, in our life, Right? The Apostle Paul said, I've not shown him but declared to you the whole counsel of God's word. So it's not just that. We need to understand that God is not just love. God is holy. His presence is holy. And anyone who approaches him should reverence God. That's why we see throughout the New Testament things like discipline, where you see a man sleeping with his father's wife where you see types of hypocrisy and expelling the moral brother, and you see things like people going to the table of the Lord in 1 Corinthians 11, and because they do it with a contemptuous heart, it says they get sick and die because of it. Believers. Wow. This is not something that would be popular to be taught in churches today because it doesn't draw a lot of crowds. But because this side of who God is is not talked about, we have churches that are so full of religion and a liberal viewpoint within the scripture. We just want to talk about the warm and fuzzy stuff, but we don't want to talk about where God gets to the point where sometimes with creation, he can say someone is worthless. Can God get to that point? Listen to these scriptures here. Psalms 5 says, The boastful should not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. Did we just read that? Psalms 11 and 5, the Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Leviticus 20, verse 23, and you shall not walk in the statutes of the nation which I am casting out before you, for they commit all these things, therefore I abhor them. Proverbs 6, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deceives wicked plans, feet that are swift to running evil, a false witness which speaks lies, and one who soars discord among the brethren. Wow. God hates. Makes me think of that scripture in Romans where it says, you know, God loved Jacob, but he hated Esau. I want you to know that while God loves the world, meaning that he was willing to die to redeem the world, 
too many people are wanting to separate their actions from who they are in this world. That's, I know that's evil what I did, but I'm not evil. I want you to know God doesn't look at things like that. But wait a minute, Dave, doesn't the Bible say that we should, you know, hate the sin but love the sinner? And, and that didn't, no, the Bible didn't say that. Gandhi said that. We just quote that like that's the Bible. Seriously. Before someone is saved, that they are subject to the hatred of God. I want you to know that. You are worthless outside of the shed blood of the Lamb of God. Worthless. It is only the sacrifice that was made on Calvary that makes you royalty. Only the blood that was shed. Nothing else. Once that blood covers you, you go from being an enemy of God, Ephesians chapter 2, the wrath of God was upon you. Why? Because he hated you. And yet he died for you. That's because God is love. That's because God is love. And when someone receives that, it overtakes them where they become a priest in the house of God and their life is about ministering to the Lord. Too many people think they're priests and they're not. A lot of people think they're saved and they're not. Can someone who is saved come and worship and how great is our God? And they just sing and they come week in and week out and they carry their Bible, they kill a couple of verses, but yet they live addicted to porn week in, week out, year in, year out. I'm going to worship God and I'm going to smoke dope. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to cheat on my wife. Can a Christian do that? Yeah, he can, but he's going to be miserable doing it and he won't do it for long. But anyone who can do it and be okay with it and not even sense that the presence of God is grieved, they're not a priest of the God and they're worthless in the sight of God. Boy, this is a fun sermon, isn't it? <laughs> Look with me at the life of the sons of Eli. Verse 13, it says, and the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice and the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged flesh hook in the hands while the meat was boiling. Then he would thrust into the pan of the kettle, the cauldron of the pot, and the priest would take for himself all that the flesh hook brought up. So they did in Shiloh, which happened to be the capital of the promised land at that time. They did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Also, before they burned the fat, which if you want to do some study on that, check out Leviticus chapter 7. That's part of the requirements of the sacrifices of God. It says, before they burn the fat, the priest's servants would come and say to the man who sacrificed, give meat for roasting to the priest, for he will not take boiled meat from you, but raw. And if the man said to him, they should really burn the fat first, then you may take as much as your heart desires, and he would then answer him, no. No. But give it to me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Therefore, the sin of the young men were very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Priests of the Lord are called to offer sacrifice. We're called to minister to God, and we do that by offering sacrifice. Here in the Old Testament, and you can check it out in, in areas like Leviticus 3 through 9 and Deuteronomy 18, and what they would do is they would take this meat, this offering, this bull, this ram, and they would separate the fat, and the first offering would be this fat offering unto the Lord. Now, back then, what happened is many people thought that fat was actually the best part of the meat, not like you think with a ribeye to flavor it. They would actually eat fat. Canaanites would eat just fat, right? So it might have looked like a, to a Canaanite going, oh, their God makes them offer the fat. And they cut all the fat up and they offer it and they burn it unto the Lord. He wants the best for himself. But, you know, of course, time went by and they found out the fat was the part that would kill you if you ate it. It was the nastiest part. God says, I don't want that in your life. So the very thing, what someone might look at, well, God, you're just a killjoy. You're trying to take all of our joy, Lord. No, he's trying to take away sin. He's trying to take away consequences and death out of your life. But these priests 
What would they do? They would say, no, we're not going to wait for our offering. And that's what they would get. As people would come and lay an offering before the Lord, the priests, the Levites, would actually get fed out of these offerings. And so out of this cauldron, this boiling pot, they could get this, this three-pronged fork and take it out, and they usually get a shoulder or a stomach, as Leviticus required, and that was their barbecue, if they would. But the sons of Eli, they said, no, we're not waiting. We don't want our meat boiled. We don't want the, feet cut off, the fat cut off. We want it now the way we want it. Is that an offering that's acceptable to the Lord? The priests of the Lord are to worship in spirit and truth. In other words, our offering to God is the way that God will require it, not the way that we would mandate it. You see what I'm saying? It's like the guy who says, well, I'm living my life for Jesus, and the Lord spoke to me and told me to divorce my wife and marry this woman. I see a lot of fat in that offering, don't you? You get my point. It's like someone coming to worship the Lord and they walk into the house of God and the presence is there and I just want to spend time with my God and yet they've been slandering their brother, having a divisive spirit about them. They're mixing in fat with their offering to the Lord. And that's why Jesus even said, hey, if you're going to bring an offering to God and you've got a problem with your brother, drop your offering there. Get rid of the fat. Go back and make this right. And so if you're wondering, man, why is it sometime as a priest of the Lord do I come into his presence and I sing and I worship and I, I bow down and I lift up hands of the Bible and I feel nothing? A couple of things. One, we don't walk by feelings. You walk by faith, Amen. So there are times where we just worship God whether we feel it or not. It's really irrelevant. But when someone goes through a season, it seems like season in, season out, constantly they're just dry and desensitized to God. That's what sin does. That's why leprosy in the Old Testament is a type of sin. It it wasn't leprosy made their digits fall off. They were just desensitized. They couldn't feel anything, and they put their hands and limbs in places they got hurt, not even realize it. Sin makes you not feel. Leprosy makes you not feel. God doesn't want sin or fat in our lives. He wants it out. Now, one could argue and go, but Dave, this is the Old Testament, and once I accept Christ, my sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life, and I am saved. You can say amen to that, because that's the truth, right? And yet we have these verses that says, he who endures until the end shall be saved. What the heck's that about? Now you got me confused. The way you'll know 100% you're saved is when you see Jesus face to face and he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into my master's joy. And you'll know 100%, right? 100% you'll know. Until then, I consider myself 99.99%. Now, well, Dave, are you preaching you can lose your salvation? Nope, not preaching heresy tonight. No, I'm not doing that. That might have bugged somebody. Good. Here's the deal. God knows our hearts, and our hearts are deceitful, and we can lie to ourselves with a religious spirit. We can glean the afterglow of someone's anointing in their presence of God and their engaged in intimacy with God, and we sense that presence. We sense that peace and that joy. That doesn't mean that it's our joy. It doesn't mean it's our peace. It means we're sensing that they're getting that. Kind of like when someone is in the presence of God and they're glorifying God and their tears are coming out of their eyes and you're looking and your heart gets softened. That doesn't mean you're having necessarily a direct encounter with God. That means you're gleaning from an experience they're having. And some people do that and they they mistake that and discern that is it's their encounter with God. God wants his own personal encounter with each of us, okay? And when you have your own personal encounter with God, your lifestyle will line up with that encounter with God. So when someone is saying, I love God, but living like a pagan, you're worthless. At least that's a safe way to look at it. That's why Paul said in Corinthians, test yourself to see whether you really be in the faith, you Corinthians, because you talk about God, but you sure don't live like Jesus lived. This isn't good. This is not an attempt for me to preach legalism and and bring us under the law tonight. Man, I love the grace of God. It's like Niagara Falls. Thank you, Lord. Just saturate me. I can't do anything good without you. You get all the glory. 
And I'm so grateful when I blow it, because I have and I will again, I can confess my sin and be in agreement that that sin was paid for at Calvary and know I have the victory over it, even though I bought the lie that I didn't. Okay? You see how that works? But we're not talking about that. We're talking about people like Eli, priests, that actually can say, I'm a believer, I love God, and I'm a Christian, and totally live a worthless pagan Canaanite lifestyle, mixing in fat with the meat of the word. It's called compromise. And we have the church doing that way too much family. This emergent movement makes me want to toss my cookies every time I see it, every time I hear it. When I hear churches go, hey, let's play ACDC, Hell's Bells, in the lobby to draw in people. (laughs) Seriously, it gets me sick. I mean, what is this? Well, we want to be relevant. We want to tie ourselves in and meet them, and we'll do anything short of sin to reach the lost, and that's the kind of stuff. What is that? Can you see Jesus taking a Stephen King movie as a theme and say, hey, I want to promote the kingdom? I don't think so. Can you see the Apostle Paul going, hey, let's play a Beatles song, man. I don't see it. I don't, (laughs) check it out. I don't want to look like the world. I don't want to mix in fat with meat. I want to be a priest and realize, Lord, I'm not here to build my church, my kingdom, or my thing. And I want you guys to know that is my heart as one of the pastors here. I'm not about building Reveal Fellowship. I really don't give a rip if you hear this message. You go, Dave, you're just too mean. I'm leaving this church. God bless you. I really mean that. I, you know, well, what about the ties? Well, we'll trust the Lord with that. I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to pass a plate and say, hey, let's fleece the flock for funds every week. Do you know God? And pick another pass the plate. I'm not doing that stuff because it's mixing fat with the meat, not taking an offering. No, putting people on guilt trips. It's God's broken. He needs your help. Okay, offering should be, Lord, I'm ministering to you out of a cheerful and a grateful heart, and I love you. It's just all about you, Jesus. You've given me everything, and this is so little in response, and it means something to you. You know, I mean, it's about ministering to him. But if it's going to please him, there shouldn't be any fat with it, and it should be according to his word. If you want to know his heart, man, you don't need to run to a prophet. You can run to this big leveler called the Bible and say, Lord, this is your heart. You, you, You want to show me your heart and your mind, and you did it through dwelling in flesh, through your son. Far out. Somebody say, far out. (laughs) It's incredible, right? (laughs) Oh, this book. I feel like I'm a kid in a candy store every time I read it. I swear I do. It's just like, God, your truth is so powerful. But, verse 18, Samuel ministered before the Lord, even as a child, wearing a linen ephod. I love this. But, right? There's a lot of bad things going on, but there's always a Samuel. There's always someone who says, I want to minister to the Lord. And I said, this little guy wore an ephod. What's an ephod? It was this incredible garment that you can read about in Exodus 28. And I cannot wait when we finish Genesis to go through the book of Exodus. Man, if you think you're enjoying Genesis, wait for Exodus. It is capital P powerful. It's amazing, right? But chapter 28 talks about this ephod, this, this priestly garment that basically gave one authority to offer sacrifice, right? He could offer sacrifice when he wore his ephod. And several things it had, it had these two stones on the shoulders that had the names of all 12 tribes of Israel engraved in it. And it had these other 12 stones, one that represent each tribe where the priest says, Lord, what ministers to you is me caring about what honors you and caring the love for your people close to my heart. See, that's what a priest really is. You love God's people. Let me tell you what, (laughs) the the, the sons of Eli, he he caused basically Israel to abhor the offerings of the Lord. Verse 17, right? It says, for men abhorred the offerings of the Lord because of the way that Eli and and his sons worshiped God in offerings. People would look and go, I don't want to go to church, right? I don't want to go to the house of God. Just a bunch of filthy mongrels and, 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 and filthy lucers. And, and all they want is this, and they want me to believe their doctrine. And if I don't believe it just like they believe it, then I'm not part of the club. And i got to speak like they speak. i got to dress like they dress. And people get to the point where they go, that just doesn't strike me as organic, as, as, as true spiritual Christianity. It, it doesn't fit right. And people look at it and they go, I don't want to go to the house of the Lord. 
Can you imagine Benjamin wanting to go to the house of the Lord and he's got his bull, he's got his ram. He's like, man, but I don't even want to go to the temple because those creeps, Phineas, Hophni, those guys, they're just, a, it's like, it's like, you know, it's like the, the, some type of, of gang there, you know? It's like the mafia there in the temple. They're sitting there, hey, we're here to give you protection. You know what I mean? It, it, it's like, I don't want to go there. Some people feel like that at church. But I'm here to tell you that Samuel was not like that. Samuel was the other side. There was darkness and there was light. Samuel was someone who says, I want people to know God. I want people to hear God. I want people to see God. I need to minister to God with my own heart first. And it says young Samuel had this ephod, this priestly gown. I mean, Scripture never says that Samuel was a priest. He was a judge. He was a prophet. Um, but he was priestly, okay? And so he wears this thing. And in verse 19, it says, Moreover, his mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer yearly sacrifice. Check it out. Hannah... And Elkanah, every year, particularly the Feast of Tabernacles, would come up to bring little Sammy his new robe. You know why? Because he was growing. Makes sense. Practical application, right on? Well, check it out. Talk about application. So, so what you're saying, Dave, this is a good parallel. So a priest who really ministers in the heart and mind of the Lord should be growing. What do you think? There should be change. <laughs> you know, when someone goes into the temple year in and year out and offers sacrifice one after another and all the activity and the emotions, but there's no change in them, it's contemptuous. It's religious. It's hypocrisy. There should be change. When I ask people, hey, what's the Lord doing in your life? The last thing I want to hear you talk about is your church are your pastor. I want to hear you talk about Jesus. I want to hear you talk about the changes that he's wrought in your life through his glory that's sanctifying you because you're in his dwelling place, his presence, and it's changing you. You can't really be in the presence of the Lord. It's going to change, it's going to change the sons of Eli, just not the kind of change they want. But the presence of the Lord will change you. And Samuel, he is growing in the Lord, ministering to the Lord. Verse 20, it says, And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, The Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that was given to the Lord. Then they would go their own way. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Check out Hannah. Hannah was the one in chapter 1 who was clinically depressed. I mean, she was pro Xanax, if you would. You know what I'm saying? She was a mess. She wouldn't eat. She wouldn't sleep. She didn't, didn't enjoy the love of her husband. Her rival, Penina, she was just giving her a hard time harassing her. She is totally bummed out. But she poured out her soul to God. Amen. And God heard her and blessed her with Samuel. What did she do with that? She offered him back to God. Lent him. A bad translation. It means return him. It's a gift. And it's from you, and I'm just giving it back to you, Lord. But check it out. There's an old saying, and it's so true. You cannot outgive God. <laughs> I mean, her quiver is full. Five, right? Oh, God bless her. I'm blessing you, and you're offering me back this offering, and now I'm going to bless you with three sons and two daughters. So many people are so worried about giving. But what will happen? I mean, if I give, what will I have? What about me? Anybody smell any fat? Right? Yeah. This is what we'll call this message the spiritual diet, right? The burn the fat diet. You can't outgive God. I mean, it, it's like the old story I heard one time of the guy that came up and says, hey, you know, I really want to give, I want to tithe, but you don't understand how much I make. I mean, if, if I tithe, that's a lot of money. And the pastor said, no problem. I'll just pray that your income will now be adjusted to what you tithe. <laughs> that's good, right? 
Bottom line is God wants to bless us, but there's this place of faith that we grow as priests of the Lord when we offer things and there's true sacrifice involved. In other words, if we're going to offer something, whether it's our time or our money or resources, it should cost us something. It should mean something, right? And I think for Hannah, it did. She wept the disgrace before a whole nation of a barren womb, and she takes that gift and offers it back to the God. Talk about a gift. Talk about a sacrifice. And what did God do? Blessed her fivefold. We need to get rid of the fat of selfness. Don't you think it's, it's ridiculous how selfish we get? Well, verse, verse 22, it says, Now Eli was very old, and he heard everything his sons did to all Israel, and how they lay with women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And that's not taking a nap, folks. That's basically saying fornication and adultery right there at the door of the dwelling place of God. So he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, for it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. In other words, they said, hey, listen, why listen to pops? We already know God calls us worthless. We know he wants nothing to do with us. There is no hope. So, hey, let me get all I can get. Kind of like Jesus said, either be hot or cold. They've decided they want to be ice cold. And they're just going to go for it. Now, the thing that drives me nuts is Eli. This father, this floundering father, he would discern sin, but he would not bring discipline to sin. He would allow his boys to consume the fat. I find it completely ironic that in chapter 4, I think it's somewhere in verse 18, listen to this right here, chapter 4, verse 18, it says that it happened that when they made a mention of the Ark of the Covenant, that Eli fell off his seat backward on the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for for the man was old and heavy. He... He was like the Jenny Craig poster child, if you would. This guy is like a walking planet implied in the Hebrew. And and I go, wait a minute. You just would let your kids just munch on fat. And here, ironically, you die falling over obese, breaking your neck. God, you got a sense of humor. Do you know what I'm saying? But Eli just had no backbone. He was more worried about being popular than being pure. There are too many kids today that are not getting the discipline that they need. They're just not. The rod is being spared and the child is spoiled. And some of you are in this room. Seriously. And you know it. Well, how do I know what's in me? Do you have a problem with authority? That's you. Do you continually practice hypocrisy and rebellion? That's you. I find it incredible that Samuel, in the midst of this type of ungodly environment, flourished spiritually. Well, you don't understand my environment. Well, what about Samuel's? (laughs) He ministered to the Lord. It was about the Lord. It was all about him. my, My wife today, she woke me up to a video from a speech from our president today that just, I got angry. I got angry. I don't know where the speech, I think it was maybe in Hawaii or Rhode Island maybe. (laughs) But in in this speech, he goes, we don't want to see women staying home, mothers with their children. We want to see them in quality preschools and have the women out in the workforce. Don't you know when a woman leaves her job to go watch her kid that she never recovers in the workforce and her wages again? We... I keep on hearing, the we. who is we? It's big brother, it's the government wanting to replace the standards of God's word with control. That's what's going on. Let me tell you what, man, 26 years ago, my wife and I, we said, we're not going to have kids and pay some pagan to raise them. 
okay? Now, I realize this is the point where some people get offended and know my heart. I don't want to, I'm not trying to offend anybody. I just want to go, do you understand the seriousness of the call upon your life as a parent to not be an Eli? Listen to the scripture that Eli knew real well. In Deuteronomy 4.10, Make that Deuteronomy eleven nineteen. You shall teach them to your children the standards of God's word, speaking of them, and will sit in your house when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. This was a commandment from God to his people saying, you shall teach your children. You shall speak the word of God and the standards of God and the commands of God. In the morning and in the evening, it'll be you training them. In other words, he didn't say, I I don't want you sending them over to the Canaanite school over the border to learn about Canaanite worship and evolution and sit in a class as a second grader and have a condom covering a banana. You laugh, but I'm serious. I'm serious, guys. It's tragic. Second graders. And we wonder why the stats on promiscuity on 11 and 12 year olds are just frightening because the Canaanites are raising our kids. They had a different standard back then. Maybe not so Eli, but they did. Look with me in Deuteronomy 21, verse 18 up on the screen. It says, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or his voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, will not heed them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city, to the gate of the city. That's where the elders sit and judgment took place. And they shall say to the elders of the city, the son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. That's not big, you know, marley fatties. This is like rocks. You follow me? This is where these guys are taking rocks this big. Some of you need two hands to crush this kid's skull. Stoning him. And you shall put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. I bet. How often did this happen? Maybe once a generation. I mean, can you imagine <laughs> little Judah, you know, watching and, and, and disobeying and then thinking about maybe Benjamin who got like stoned last year? Oh, oh yes, I remember Benjamin. I, I ain't doing that. There were consequences. We don't allow that type of activity in our home. Now, I'm not trying to start a new religion and get some type of Sharia law for Christians here and say, hey, we should be stoning kids here. Hey, we're we're living in the New Testament and we're living in the New Covenant. Praise God. But that doesn't mean we throw out the standards of discipline out the window under the banner of grace, which is a lot of what they want to throw holiness out the window under the banner of grace, a lot of Christians do. But when it comes to raising kids, we got too many parents who go, oh, well, God loves them. Yeah, Enough to smack them upside the head when they need it. God disciplines those he loves. I got four kids who are now adults, and I have, you know, three of them I had to kick out of my house because they were drinking, smoking dope, fornicating. Praise God. The oldest one now is one of your pastors. (laughs) Hallelujah. Right? Right? My daughter, who worships God and ushers the presence of God in and has this incredible Levitical gift leading worship, I wanted to wring her neck. The love of God, huh? Yeah. Tell you what, some tough times. But my call was to minister before the Lord as a parent, not to be their buddy, not to be their friend, and I learned not to try and be the Holy Spirit. I blew that many times all in the name of Jesus. I had a lot to learn, still do. But I knew this, I needed to have a backbone, the willingness to say, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And if serving the Lord is not desirable for you to do, then there is the door, pal. Seriously. 
I'll never forget when Bethany came to me several years after she repented and she said, Dad, I just want you to know something. You know, I know I put you through a lot and I know I said a lot of hurtful things and did a lot of hurtful things, but I want you to know how much I respect you for taking a strong stand for what the truth was and I love you so much for that. Man, I could cry right now thinking about it. Oh, man, because it was so much pain. So much suffering, and it opened doors to the enemy to inflict guilt on areas where I blew it as a parent, and I could write a book. You know, so many areas the enemy would lie to me, and I would go, oh, maybe it's my fault that they're sinning. Maybe it's my fault that they're, you know, having, they're being contemptuous before God and mixing in fat with the meat. Maybe it's my own hypocrisy and the bad example. It's my fault, so how harsh can I be? I feel like a hypocrite even saying anything to him. But the enemy just loves to paralyze parents with all those lies, Okay. You've got to stand up for the truth and grow a backbone, especially your dad's. Don't be an Eli. Our kids are screaming, man, love me enough to say no. Love me enough to give me consequences for my actions. Because let me tell you what, you can, you can choose the choice of whether you're going to honor God or not, but you can't choose the consequences. God chooses those. And you don't want him to do that, okay? I would rather be disciplined and listen to a brother who comes up to me and says, hey, Dave, I know you asked me to be accountable with you and all this, and I just want to tell you I have a check in my spirit about what you said here or what you did here or what you didn't do here. I would rather listen to my brother in the Lord than ignore this brother and that brother and that leader and that leader and have God's hand come down upon me. I would rather listen, okay? He'll do it in love, but that don't mean it's going to be fun. He disciplines those he loves. That doesn't mean he gives you a pat on the back and say, come on, let's try it. No, no. Sometimes it's swallowing you with a big fish. Sometimes it's this thorn in your flesh that you're going, I didn't have to go yet, but you're just so stinking stubborn I had no choice. God doesn't want to go there. So, man, dads, may we rise up and be men who say, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Now, I know you heard this, some of you dads and moms tonight, and I know you have issues. The enemy has inflicted you with lies and guilt and justification in your compromising of your parenting. But I am telling you, your kids are screaming for you to stand up and really be like God in their life, to be a real picture of God in their life. That is love and that is holiness, both. Both are important, amen? Well, moving on. It says that, verse 26, and the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor with the Lord and men. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when you were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? We don't know who this man of God was, but here he references Aaron, the first priest. Most likely this is some prophet that God has sent, and man, he is calling Eli out. He said, did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense and to wear an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? Why do you kick or scorn my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling place? And honor your sons more than me, and make yourselves fat with the best of the offerings of Israel, my people. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and your arms of your father's house so that they will not be old in your house and you will see an enemy in my dwelling place despite all the good which God does for Israel and there shall not be an old man in your house forever. But any of your men whom do not cut off my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart and all the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. Now this shall be a sign to you that will come upon your two sons of Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. Wow, can you imagine some prophet coming to you as a dad or a mom and saying, hey, because you've loved your kids more than you've loved me, you've brought a curse upon them. 
your unwillingness to stand for the truth, and now the consequences are coming upon them. And in one day, both of them are going to die. Talk about a sobering moment before God. Wow. Guys, if this is not a wake-up call for some of us as priests over our children, that we have a responsibility before God to train them up in the Lord, does that ensure and guarantee that they'll follow the Lord? No. You're not doing it to get a result. Too many people go, well, I want to do this in my kid's life, and I want to do that somehow so I can invoke spiritual fruit in their life so I can feel good about me. That's not parenting. Whether you raise two kids, you might get a Cain, you might get an Abel. It's between them and God, but your standard in your home is between you and God. Okay? It's not about guaranteeing that one's going to be a pastor, one's going to be a worship leader, one's going to be a doctor, one's going to be... No, no, no. It's about ministering to the Lord. Lord, I'm a parent for your glory, not for my glory. Not so I can say, my kid does this, or my kid's done that, or my kid... It's not about you. It's about the Father of lights. It's about his kids, because they're really his. Amen? Amen? Yeah, well, boy, Eli's learning this the hard way. Closing out this chapter, it says, verse 35, Then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before my anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and say, please put in one of the priestly positions that I may eat the piece of bread. Here, God says, hey, even in the midst of a corrupt and perverse generation and a priesthood that is causing people to go, I don't want anything to do with God or connect with God or worship God, there is a priest that I raise up. Probably not Samuel that he's talking about, because again, priest, Samuel was never a priest, but this scripture was actually fulfilled, and we read about it in 1 Kings 8, about a priest named Zadok, who basically replaced a corrupt priest, not only under David's reign, but under Solomon's reign as well. In other words, there was a corrupt priest, and God says, I'm going to remove the corrupt priest, just like he did with Eli and his sons, and I'm going to bring in someone who cares about portraying my heart and my mind to people. Not your agenda, my agenda, says the Lord. That's what a priest is called to do. Lord, I'm in your presence, and I'm here to serve you, and I'm here to honor you. I'm here to align myself with your thoughts and your words and where your hands would go and where your feet would go. I want to honor you. And the whole beauty of this was, and this, we'll wrap it up with this, guys. Listen closely. You understand the types and the shadows that the writer of Hebrew talks about all through the first five books of Moses. Powerful. This is what the Lord, this is what eternity saw. Eternity saw man entering the gates of God's presence with thanksgiving, there passing the tribe of Judah. They would come and they would look at the altar and the horns of the altar with blood on it and a blood sacrifice that opened the door to go to the basin where there was a picture of water baptism, where they could walk through sanctification in the presence of God and they walked into the holy place where they would look at the table of showbread, a representation of none other than Jesus, if you would, the bread of life, the lampstand filled with the olive oil and the Holy Spirit and this altar of incense that sat there right before this incredible veil, Right? All that we could just actually experience the presence of God. It was supposed to be that we would view the sacrifice and it would blow us away that, some, that our sin brought death to something else that was living. All that we might go into the presence of God. That's what it was all about. Wow, death. And understand, this was not a, a jewelry store, guys. This was a place where there was just slush and dirt and blood and intestines and entrails. It was disgusting because sin is disgusting. You understand? And they would look at this grotesque horror picture and see all this death and go, that's what it took that I could go into the presence of God because of my sin, because of my fat? Wow. All I want to do when I get there is I want to minister to the Lord. I want to go to that table, and I want to recognize that it, he satisfies me. That bread, it's only his word that satisfies me. 
I want to go to that lampstand and go, the only thing that is light is you. Everything else is darkness outside of you, God. And the only vertical activity I'm going to have is to you, God, because that's what brings me into this most holy place. Incredible. That's why the writer of Romans, the Apostle Paul, incredible verse, we'll close with this. He says, I beseech you. I get in your face. I shout it out loud in the Greek. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be metamorphosized, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable, the perfect will of God. Guys, check it out. This is the deal. He says, look at the cross. Look at the death. Look at the horror of it all. And that's what it took to get you to the place where you could worship God, where you could come into his presence, where you could sacrifice something that was acceptable to him. Because his blood removes all the fat, hallelujah. Amen? Removes all of it. And that way, when you come in, you'll be transformed from the inside out. This sanctification process. Remember in Exodus 29, he says, And my glory, my weightiness will sanctify you. It's being in my presence. It's just like being under a waterfall. It just washes away. Washes away your desire for the things of this world the lies that you're living in defeat or you have to work for victory versus he won for it on the cross for you. It's a gift. All the lies get washed away and it all starts with looking at the sacrifice because there's really only one. Every other sacrifice is an overflow of gratitude from that one viewing of that one sacrifice that was done once and for all. Man, and when you get that, you're one of those people in the dwelling place of God that you grow year after year. You carry a love for God and a love for his people close to your heart. Man, that's Christianity. Religion, Christianity is, I, I, I can't do that. You know, Christianity is, I don't have to do that. I don't have to live for the world. I don't have to be part of the Canaanites. I've been delivered. Father, that is our heart tonight, that you would open our eyes that we could do this in remembrance of you. As we hold the bread, as we hold the cup, and we remember the words that you spoke on the cross, that incredible altar on Calvary that's altered our lives, God, you said it is finished. Father, we thank you for the blood that was shed. We thank you that our names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, God, that you paid a way for us. Father, we ask that you would just baptize the souls in this room afresh with your Holy Spirit. Empower us, God, to walk as Jesus walked. Father, where there is a rebellious spirit to authority, God, may you break that down tonight in the name of Jesus. Where there is a fear of rejection, Lord, may you just open the hearts of everyone in this room to know that you are the propitiation for sin. You've taken that wrath that we deserved on yourself. Thank you for rescuing us, God. We offer tonight to you, Lord. It's our offering, our heart, our will. And we ask, Father God, that you would draw us into this place of intimacy with you. We don't want to live the life like Phineas and Hophni who only knew you in their mind. We want to know you. We want to know the love of God. Father, bless this time of fellowship. As we move amongst our brothers and sisters, we ask that you would speak words of life through us. Someone here needs to be loved on. Someone here needs a word of encouragement. And someone here needs a word of correction. We pray, Father God, that your gifts would move in the body of Christ tonight as we take time, Lord, to love the people in this room like we're loving you personally. We pray this for your pleasure, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. Family, God bless you.